As we continue to reflect on the 2022 Red Sox season, we decided to hand out our own awards for this Red Sox season. You are Locked On Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to welcome you back into the Locked On Red Sox podcast, and thank you so much for making Locked On Red Sox your first listen of every single day. I'm your host, Massachusetts Pirates Team Insider, Jakey Nizuski. We're here, as always, with my co-host, and this is Lauren Willand. No joke, I almost said Campbell right there. But, uh, you know, looking at, you know, this past season, obviously we've talked about it a ton. Roller coaster of emotions, but there were some good moments as well. And, you know, we, we did our whole episode of, you know, the best moments, you know, the surprises and the disappointments. But I thought it would be cool to sort of hand out our own awards for this season. You know, not not any, any of the Red Sox players got specific awards like an MVP or a Cy Young. Maybe they'll have some gold gloves out there. But uh, looking at first, we, we, we got MVP, Cy Young, most improved player, best defender, and rookie of the year. And we asked you, the audience on Twitter, to let us know who you think really are all of these and are should be awarded them. And uh, I made a little bit of a joke. Uh, I, I feel like some people might have taken it seriously. And uh, I said Tyler Danish was going to be my solidified MVP. It was either between Tyler Danish or Yu Chang, you know, kind of came up with it in the, in the spot. I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to do, do somebody that, you know, nobody thinks should be the MVP. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's funny because people people take the internet way too seriously as it is. And when I saw that you tweeted that, I was like, oh no, people are going to like either take this way too far and think that Jake is serious or <laughs> just go with it and be like, oh, okay, well, I think uh, XYZ should be MVP or like, oh, good put, good pick, man. Right. I'm like, or someone's going to take this like literal and be like, that's actually a really good pick. Like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> the internet is a wild, wild place. Exactly. Well, I kind of wanted to like tease it a little bit as well, but uh, you know, for the most part, that there was there was very similar answers, but there was a good amount of people as well that did a nice job of mixing mixing in some other people, and they even mentioned in, in their reply saying, you know, I wanted to mix it up a little bit. You know, starting off with with the MVP, it, it was it was sort of guessable of who the who the two sort of contenders for this would be. Uh, Xander Bogarts got three votes. Rafael Devers got. Four, and this was sort of my pick as well. And you know, it was it was really nice to see Xander really pick up his production, specifically in the power department, uh, by the end of the season. But you know, throughout the year, he was one of the most consistent hitters in the entire league. And you know, we also saw his defense get a lot better throughout the year. But Devers overall was just consistently so good for this lineup. Yeah, and Devers also improved on his defense a lot too, which was fantastic to see. Cause I've harped on that so many times over the last three seasons, really in particular, my pick would be Xander Bogarts. A lot of that is you mentioned it, the consistency, uh, also the importance that he is to this team and just how valuable he is to this team. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it too, is that he had, he was in the chase for the AL batting title while he's not 100% healthy. And even though he didn't have a ton of home runs, like he always did, he was really hitting for average this year. We obviously saw that with him being in the AL batting race till like the last week or two of the season. And like I said, he wasn't 100% healthy pretty much all year. He was hurt in May and he admitted that it was still kind of bothering him throughout the summer. And he still gave his all every single day. And Devers is certainly deserving in our little award show here, but I'm going to go with Xander Bogarts. And I'm glad that you brought up those injuries because that, that was something, you know, I was really thinking about when when really figuring out who the most valuable player of this team was. And you, you really hear it all the time, especially during the end of the year when, you know, people are debating for the actual AL or NL MVP, sort of who is that most valuable player. And Xander, not only on and off the field, really was so valuable to just the Red Sox roster with how tough this season was. And even when he was injured, you really saw him on the front step, 
cheering on his team. And I wouldn't be surprised if behind the scenes you had you had a lot of his teammates, you know, talking about how you know he really helped them be able to overcome uh, multiple different struggles throughout this year. And he's always just been such a clubhouse guy. And you, you really saw it from you know not only past players like Pedro Martinez and David Ortiz, but also guys like Alex Verdugo, Rafael Devers, really just calling on Red Sox ownership to to pay Xander Bogarts this offseason and give them the money he deserves. You know, you even had David Ortiz spraying the money, the money thing uh, during the All-Star game, but he was just so valuable to this team. And you, you just hear it time and time again, the non-announced or official captain uh, just is, is the reason why this team is able to either be good or bad on a given basis. Yeah, I mean, we've talked – at length about the importance that he brings to this team and you know you have so many you have Alex Cora you know hoping that he stays of course he's going to say that and of course he's you know he's going to he's going to vouch for his players and I'm sure someone like Alex Cora is going to go to war to bring Xander Bogarts back to this team if he decides to opt out I I can't imagine he will opt in but it's he's just so so important to this team for the reasons you mentioned his leadership and just the way he carries himself in the clubhouse, you know, he doesn't come off this cocky dude. He just wants there. He just wants to be there to play baseball, make the people around him better. And he wants to win games. I mean, what, what professional athlete doesn't, but Bogarts is just a, a very special kind of teammate and a very, very good athlete. And he's just somebody that, and I think it was Alex Cora who said this, that him endeavors are just people you build your team around. So hopefully later on in this off season, we can talk about the Red Sox hopefully signing Xander Bogart to this long-term deal and that he hopefully he can win a, a real MVP award and not just on our Locked on Red Sox award show, which is still very important. It's a very important award show. We we, we should have gotten like little trophies or medals oh, or something should've. like that. Or maybe we, we can just give out some of the... Stein. Hey, there you go. <laughs> we'll just give out gold stars or something like that. But, it, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the stat sheet right now from throughout the season. I was trying to, like, rack my brain of who would be, you know, like a dark horse MVP. And no no name really, really you know, comes out in bold among the others uh, other than those two names. You know, really, really looking at anybody else, you know, that, that were so important for the team specifically in 2021. They were either injured or underperformed. And, um, you know, we're going to get to some of the other people throughout this episode who who were just so important for this team. But uh, I really think that Devers and Xander are are the main two picks and should be the only picks for the MVP. And, uh, you know, now looking at the Cy Young, you know, this Waka take that I had at the start of the season continues to be more wrong and more wrong. But I, f- I feel like I've done an all right job of, uh, you know, speaking my wrongs. And um, it was it was also really nice for, you know, uh, you know, to be able to speak with him after, you know, his no hitter in Worcester. Very nice guy and um, really hope that, you know, he, he signs a long term deal with the Sox. But he got five votes for the Cy Young. And, you know, we, we've talked about it th- throughout this offseason, especially uh, how he was really the ace of this staff. And um, it's it's a, it's unfortunate that, you know, s- some of the other guys like Nick Bavetta or Nathan Avaldi, you know, weren't able to be up to his level uh, at times. Uh, it was really nice to see Waka continue to be so consistent for this Red Sox team. And any time you saw him really as a pitching matchup for a series, you circled that game as essentially an automatic win. Yeah, I mean, I know your Michael Waka take was bad, but don't worry. You're not the one who said Bobby Dalbeck would lead this team in home runs at the end of the season. <laughs> but I think that Michael Waka is the obvious choice for, for the Red Sox Cy Young. He was just so incredibly valuable, reliable, steady, even when he went on the IL. He came back and he was still still the Red Sox most consistent pitcher. He did hit that kind of fall back in his last two starts of the season, but at that point, did it even really matter for the Red Sox? No. But every time he was on the mound, it was like it was almost like you said, like a guaranteed win. You were confident he was going in there. If you told me he was gonna have the most wins, the fewest losses at the end of the season, I'd be like, okay, that's very, very bold, but that's why we do bold predictions. And I was really impressed with what we saw all season. Just the, like I said, the sturdiness, the reliability. When there wasn't a whole lot of re- reliability among the pitching staff as a whole, not just the starters, but the bullpen as well. Just so much change due to injuries. There was so much inconsistency throughout the entire season. But Waka was that constant steadiness and that constant like breath of fresh air that the Red Sox so desperately needed. And it'd be really smart for them to offer him a qualifying offer and to get him back in a Red Sox uniform. 
especially if you if they're serious about being contenders in 2023 and being better than they were in 2022, I think Mike mm-hmm. Walker makes your team better or keeps your team better at least. Like, your team is probably worse without him unless you have a very solid backup plan to bring in a, a two, two, another two solid starting pitchers here. And when, when you look at the market, it's just so top heavy with, with, with some of these guys like Verlander, DeGrom, who are, are going to, you know, try and get $40 million. And, you know, you, you can bring back a guy like Nathan Navardi, but it's it's just going to, you know what you're going to get from him. Uh, and a guy like Waka, you, you really saw how solidified of a pitcher he was throughout the uh, 2022 season for the Red Sox. And, um, you know, now looking as well, uh, another guy who, was slated by and got one vote for the Cy Young, but got majority of votes for the most improved player was John Schreiber. And he really came out of nowhere. Somebody who, you know, came up for the Red Sox uh, once at the beginning of the season, then got sent down and then got sent up, excuse me, or called back up in May and then stuck uh, for the remainder of the season. And obviously at the end of the year, after they started to overuse him to a point, sort of like they did uh, with with Matt Barnes, uh, you, you saw his team sort of, hit him up a little bit but for the majority of the time john schreiber was the staple uh that you really brought in uh if the red sox were you know needed to get out of an inning or you just need a reliable reliever to come in and you really just saw it in the stats 222 era over 64 games um and he's somebody who i am so excited to see how he continues to improve and improve uh, not only next season but seasons to come yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun, hopefully, to watch this team next year and to watch a lot of the people who were surprises this year for the Red Sox, the John Schreibers, the Michael Wackas, to see, I mean, especially Michael Walker if he comes back to the Red Sox, but just to see how they do again, if they have other, another season like they did, whether it be here or elsewhere. But there's a lot of optimism going into next year, kind of. Um, even though like the season ended the 2022 season ended so poorly there's still a lot to be optimistic about and by a lot i mean you know a couple players the biggest pessimist thing going into the season is xander bogarts but you know you look at you look at what john schreiber did for this team and again who like who is this guy they just i felt they just plucked this guy and they they, he just worked out for them kind of like garrett whitlock they just kind of plucked that guy from the rule five draft and he worked out for the red Mm -hmm. sox and I've loved what he was able to do. Like Waka, he provided that stability, that reliability. I didn't want to have a heart attack and go run and hide every time somebody, <laughs> every time he came out of the bullpen doors. I was like, all right, we have a chance here because he was very, very sturdy and reliable. And like I mentioned earlier, just not something the Red Sox had a lot of this year when they're pitchers. And he was so electric out of the bullpen, especially when yes. when John Schreiber came in, especially, you know, it, it worked so well with his arm slot as well. Uh, just so filthy. And, you know, you look oh, at the yeah. most improvement award. It, it really signifies somebody who obviously struggled at the beginning of their career or last season and then was able to do so great this year with a massive improvement. When, when you look at 2019 and 2020, John Schreiber with the Tigers, a 623 ERA with over 13 games. Uh, and then in 2020, uh, over 15 innings allowed 11 earned runs. So you just saw a completely different player, much more improved player uh, this time around for John Schreiber. But, you know, continuing to look at the most improved award, we have two more players that we are yet to talk about, but we're going to get into that in our second segment. And I just want to take a second to talk to you about Roan. So I don't know about you, but I have a tough time fitting into my dress shirts. Sometimes they're uncomfortable. Sometimes they don't fit me. You know, I'm kind of a skinny guy. So sometimes they're too baggy or, you know, they're too tight and I can barely breathe in them. And, you know, also you want to be able to have something that looks good and makes you feel good as well. And especially when you have a dress shirt, you're you're, you're going out to look your best in prep pop shape. And Rome does an amazing job of not only combining all those things together, but most importantly, making it breathable. And they actually started, they actually made a dress shirt that radically reinvented and stepped up the dress shirt game with their commuter shirt. It's the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible shirt known to man. And here's exactly why. The mobility is everything. And they have a comfortable four-way stretch fabric that provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy what life throws your way. 
whether you're commuting to work or you're going to play 18 holes of golf. And you can also look good very easily. So it's time to feel confident in a wrinkle-free shirt without the hassle. And with Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear just like that. As you stretch and wear the shirt, it's just that simple. And they also have odor-free tech. With their gold fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable. So you can ditch a dry cleaner all together. And it also takes away all those extra fees that come with the dry cleaner and it makes it so much more simple. Their commuter shirt, you can get through any day of work and straight to whatever comes next. So head over to roan.com slash locked on and use the promo code locked on to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to rhone.com slash locked on and use the code locked on. It's time to find your corner office comfort. So go and check out Roan today. Now, continuing to look at the most improved player award, another person that I didn't expect that we were going to be talking about today, but he sort of had a very underratedly well-pitched season for the Red Sox, which is Matt Strom. One person had voted for him. It was cool because he, he also put in the reply as well. I'm actually, we'll actually shout him out. It's uh, Seamus Young. Uh, he, he said, you know, it, it was really tough, but uh, I went with Strom for the sake of variety. And uh, it, it was cool to really see, you know, a guy in Matt Strom who was coming off an injury with the Padres. Also, when you look at his 2021 season, over he only pitched six six games, had an 8-10 ERA, and what he was able to do with the Red Sox, not sort of what you really anticipated, but, you know, I feel like the early season numbers were much better than the late season numbers. Looking at his ERA, just plainly, you wouldn't think they had that great of a season of 833, but he was very dependable for the most part for the Red Sox throughout the season. Yeah, he did his job and he did he did it well. I think kind of like we talked about with Schreiber, it was like a who is this guy kind of thing. And sometimes that's what a team needs is they need those kind of who are these people? I don't want to call them no names because that just sounds degrading. And that's not what I'm trying <laughs> to say at all. But Nobody knows it, who you are. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like it's, it's, those, it's those guys that, you know, we know the Xander Bogarts. We know the Rafael Devers, the J.D. Martinez. Right. We expect them to do well and come through for this team. But when you have somebody who is little known and not as well known and not a household name, coming in and making themselves kind of a mainstay in this lineup, this rotation, it, it makes it more fun to watch this season. And it makes it fun kind of rooting for them because you're like, oh, can they continue to do this all season? Right. Will this be a, a stable thing? Are they going to be, you know, really good? Like, are they going to be like Matt Barnes in 2021 and then Matt Barnes in second half 2021? So it, it's been really fun to watch Matt Strom all season and just kind of like Schreiber provide ability out of the bullpen and my grandmother loved him. She absolutely <laughs> adores him and she loves his hair. And every yep. time she talked about like how That's he like funny. tucks how he tucks it behind his ear. It's it's so cute. So I'm oh a big gosh. Matt Strom, big Matt Strom guy over here. Um, but for me, my most improved player, I'm gonna go with what Seamus said and do it for the sake of variety. I'm gonna say Matt Barnes with an asterisk though, like second half Matt Barnes. Yeah. Um because he was, he spent a lot of time in the IL. He was really struggling with his shoulder, that inflammation. We saw all the struggles from 2021 creep over into 2022. He was so dominant after he came back from the IL. I don't know if he figured it out. I don't know if he was just like, I need to get my mind right, like what it really was. But he looked to be really, really strong out of that closer position. And it's, you know, it didn't cause me anxiety to watch him pitch. It was fun. It was dominant and just to see him really just attack hitters again and kind of be that first half 2021 Barnes was really exciting and a good way to end the season so I was my award my most improved player will go to him much like Seamus said because of for the sake of variety because I, I can see the other votes here mm -hmm. so Matt Strom a uh, Matt Strom Barnes has my vote for most improved player is with a little asterisk, but um, half season Matt Barnes. We love we love second half Matt Barnes in 2022. And you know the stats really back up that take because you know when you look at first half 20 20 appearances 794 ERA and then 24 post All Star break 159 ERA. You just saw a drastically different yeah. pitcher, and you also saw much more conf confident 
in his pitches and comfortability, I felt like as well, because, you know, it, it really felt like in, in the first half, he was still coming off sort of like that hangover, like we saw in the second half of 21. And he, he still felt that pressure. I felt I feel like a lot of it was mental. And he, he was really trying to live back up to that expectation of the 2021 all star and also trying to you know live up to the expectations of his brand new contract and uh, I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see you know what type of Matt Barnes we see next season hopefully it's more of uh, it, it's the Bobby Dalbeck effect but it actually translates to the next season you know that's something that we we really expected Bobby Dalbeck to do is take his second half and put it into the first half or majority of the this next season and so Matt Barnes just has to do the same and you know, for me, in in in, um, in sake of variety, uh, another person that I really thought of was Christian Arroyo. You know, uh, we really saw him drastically get on base much more this season. It was funny because I actually said that on Twitter, and uh, somebody started throwing all of these, you know, OBP, OPS, slugging, and you know, all these saber metrics and. I said, buddy, just listen. If you look at 2021, he had 44 strikeouts over 43 hits. And in 2022, 49 strikeouts and 80 hits. So you tell me what are better numbers. And that's the thing is you, you really saw him be so much more comfortable, not only at the plate. We saw a, a lot more of Christian Arroyo. You know, he, he didn't get COVID all the time. And, you know, he was really able to fully show his full potential. I, I think he really deserves to get a pat on the back for a much more improved season. Uh, and now starting to look at the defenders. I was very curious to, uh, on, on what people chose. We had five people say Trevor Story. Um, one pe one person says Xander Bogards. Another person say, say uh, Rob Refschneider. But we can start off with Story. When he was on the field, looked like second coming to Dustin Madroya at second base. Yeah, I think this is the obvious answer. And even, even if I wanted to go with someone else for a variety reason, I don't think I could. I think Trevor Story just was so so good and playing second base I mean yes it's still an infield position but you think of someone who's played shortstop pretty much his entire career comes over and plays second there's already all these storylines around him because Bogarts all season is like oh well if Bogarts leaves and he can just slide to, to stop right kind of thing right. so he came in and he was just his season started a little slow but his defense was always always there and it was really, really good to see because, you know, we talked about his offensive splits away from Coors Field. And it's it was just really fun to watch him. I feel like I've said fun so many times this episode. It's going to be the buzzword of the episode is fun. But I think Trevor Story brought a lot to this team and brought a lot to like. And to have a second baseman, a solid second baseman that the Red Sox, I feel like really haven't had in a long time, probably since Dustin Pedroia. And it was just nice to see that position be – manned by somebody who was confident who could make plays and was just all over the field i'm excited for him to come back next year and hopefully just be a fully healthy season i feel like that's the case with a lot of these guys for next year right. but i a full season of a healthy trevor story could be a full season of a dangerous trevor story good pick all you five people who picked it good pick and he was laying out for everything it, it, it was. was it was really impressive and you know especially you know i remember there was one play that comes to mind where uh he made, he made a diving play uh to ultimately end the game and I, I remember you know i don't remember exactly the situation but uh if he didn't make that play it would have been a really tough for the red sox to eventually close it out but uh he's just somebody who i'm so excited as well to see who with a full season under his belt at Fenway at second base, what he's really able to do. And, you know, I, I said it, I think it was a few months ago, but especially if the Xander contract gets done early, Story and, and Xander are able to, you know, continue to build up that chemistry at second and shortstop on some, on some off season work as well. And, you know, Xander is somebody that somebody else brought up, uh, and we already said it, his defense was so much better this year. You really saw, um, I guess, some of the critiques that, you know, not only some writers, but some, but some fans had of Xander of, you know, not being a very reliable shortstop. And, you know, maybe he wasn't worth the money as a shortstop. And boy, did he tell you. And boy, did he shove it in your face. But uh, it, it was really cool to see him continue to improve at that position. Yeah. And I think that you know, that's always going to be a question or a storyline is Xander's defense. Yes, there are, if you look at the stats of every single shortstop, yes, there are better defensive shortstops than Xander Bogarts. But we talked about this in the first segment, just what he brings to this team, the the leadership, the the respect, 
and the way he just communicates with with players with his managers with the personnel it's just a very hard very hard to replicate all of that and he did it very much improve his defense this year and i think that i really like to see him take an, another step next year hopefully with the red sox but i want to see him just really to me he's he's 30 years old so we know that you know he's he i feel like he can only get better right but i mean that's that's my hope anyway because i feel like he has improved from the last two years in particular but i really liked that he's you know he wants to play shortstop there was all this talk in the beginning of the season i'll just move him to second or i'll just move him to third and then you could put a story at short devers at dh it was all this like flip-flopping but this man wants to play shortstop and i feel mm -hmm. like xander is somebody who if he wants to do something this is something a position he's played a majority of his major league career he's going to do it and he's going to hear the the talk he's going to hear what people have to say and he's going to build off that so I, I feel like, you know, next year, let's just say he does come back with the Red Sox, a, a fully healthy Xander and a motivated Xander, and especially if he signs a long-term deal, that's a, a great recipe for somebody who's going to have a very, very good season. Great recipe. And we're going to continue to speak about the uh, best defender as, as well as look into the rookie of the year this season. But before we get into our final segment, uh, Lauren wants to talk to you about Bill Barr. You probably know by now how much I love Built Bar, how much I love telling you about Built Bar. But now I want to tell you about the Built Bar Puffs, which you've probably heard me talk about a hundred times on here. Because if you have not tried the Built Bar Puffs yet, you are depriving yourselves. There, there's this new brand new flavor. It's delicious and it's indulgent cookie dough. We just got some a few weeks ago, and this, these were the first ones that were eaten out of the box. We got a bunch of new flavors, but I went right for the cookie dough because. Cookie dough is my favorite flavor of pretty much everything. They're co covered in 100% real chocolate, just like every other Bilt Bar. And I'm going to introduce you to what, sh what is sure to be your new favorite. That is the Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs. They're light. They're chewy. There's real cookie dough chunks, which is like the biggest selling factor right there. And like I said, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. So they taste good. They're good for you. It's pretty much all the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it and the potential for salmonella. There's only 160 calories. There's 15 grams of protein. And you can run to built.com right now and snag a box for you and the family. It will be the perfect treat, whether you guys go out for a hike, you go out for a family trip, a day trip. These are the perfect on the go snacks. And like all built bars, that means they're healthy, that means they're tasty. They're the chocolate covered cookie dough it has a light, fluffy texture. It's not it's not super chewy or cardboardy like some other protein bars out there. And what's great about Built Bar is that all of their bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently. And it provides a ton of health benefits. So eat something that tastes good and is good for you. I promise you're going to love the new Punk Puff, whether you need a snack for after your workout, even during your workout, or before your workout, or if you want a late night treat like I'm about to have after we finish recording this pod, it's the perfect protein bar and they taste better than the bar in my honest opinion. Ditch the calories, ditch the fat, ditch the sugar, grab yourself a Built Bar, go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKEDON15 to get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKEDON15 for 15% off at Built.com. So now continuing to look at the best defender and looking at the final vote that somebody had, which was Rob Ref Snyder. And I sort of agree with this. I, I, I think, you know, he, he was a little bit um, over, over, overlooked with his defense. It was mainly his consistent offense. And, you know, the one thing that, you know, when you think of Rob Ref Snyder's defense that comes, at least in my mind, is when he missed the ball on the right. But that's that's something where I, I think, it, especially with how hard that rain was coming down, if you put anybody out there, the best defender out there, he, it would be really difficult for them to get the catch. And I'll never forget the announcers were like, "He should have made that." I'm like, "Bro, stop! You're in the booth. You you don't let's see you go out and try it. Do a whole Jaron Durant thing there." But uh, Ref Center, I, I think you know, had some really great defense and just definitely deserved a vote. Yeah, I, I like this vote for the boldness of it. I'm glad no one voted for Jaron Duran. That is a very good sign that people yep. watched good baseball, and not necessarily good baseball, but they they knew what they were watching this season with the Red Sox. But, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't vote for him, but I did like what he brought to this team when he was given the opportunity to play. He was fun to watch. And mm -hmm. I feel like the most elite outfielders, the most elite baseball players, still are going to to miss plays they should have made so i mean that goes for everyone that goes for gold glovers that goes for 
the, all the, the Ref Schneiders in the world, but bold vote. And I like it for the boldness because I like these kind of out of the box thinkers instead of just going with, with the, with the easy slash obvious vote. Well, I think for the rookie of the year, the final award, it was, it was a lot of different sample sizes and, uh, Brian Bayo went in a landslide, seven votes, uh, and I, I think it was very well deserved. I mean, when you look at Bayo's uh, his splits between his you know first five, first four starts, and then his final six starts, it's pretty insane. You know, first four starts, eight eighty two ERA, and then his final six, two fifty nine ERA. Ultimately, ended up finishing with a four seventy one, two and eight record. But that's just what's going to happen when you're a young pitcher coming up out of nowhere uh, when. when you know, somebody gets injured and you just need to fill right in. You're, you're not going to, you're not going to easily just fit right in into the major leagues. And uh, especially for somebody as well, who, who started in double A and ultimately became one of the most surprising pitchers for the Red Sox. And that was the thing with Bayo is that he was not major league ready when he was recalled. It was just a matter of, we are injured. We are, we need somebody right now. And they had to recall Bayo. He was dominant in Worcester before he was recalled, but we've seen how the, Success in the minor leagues doesn't always immediately transfer over to the success in, ma in the majors. And there was this a unanimous vote? Did everyone who responded? That's unanimous. amazing. Unanimous. I love it. Somebody, somebody just, somebody just uh, replied, and uh, they they added two things. We don't have to comment on it, but it's least valuable Franchi's last sale co co winners, and then biggest disappointment Jaron Duran. You've already heard why we why we probably agree with that. But, um, you know, I, I really want to thank everybody that interacted on this tweet. It really does mean a lot to us when um, we're able to use some of our audience, uh, you, you know, replies. So I want to shout out, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push this, but Lance Paredes, uh, Seamus Young, uh, Stephen Shaw, um, Waiting for Banner 18, Dan Noonan, uh, Vinny Demera, uh, Boston Sports Gordo, and Ed Hand, uh, really appreciate everybody giving their responses. We're, we we want to continue to try and do this, get oh, yeah. you know the, the audience involved as much as we can. But uh, you know, it was really fun to you know hand out these awards, continuing to you know really reflect on the season. And I actually noticed something today that uh, we have not brought up yet, but uh, we surpassed six hundred episodes we of did. this podcast, and uh, pretty pretty incredible. You know. Um, everything that we were able to do throughout the season uh i i tallied up you know the 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 season episodes that we did we did 125 and so pretty incredible that that you know we, we were able to um really help this podcast surpass 600 and you know it's all up to everybody who listens to this each and every single day yeah i mean it's it's a milestone i remember when we did episode 500 i feel like that was Me yesterday too. and it's it's crazy to think how fast it's gone by and it's crazy to think as much of a struggle the season was at times and much as hard as this team was to watch at times, we still showed up every day. Our listeners showed up every day as angry as they were. And <laughs> it was fun to relate to them at, as right. there we go saying fun again. It, it was great to relate to them in our frustrations as well. And just being like, all right, we need to cut the cord here. Like, because there's just <laughs> nothing left of this season except like 20 games. And it's going to be really hard to get through, but it's we wouldn't be here without our listeners and we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to keep doing this if it wasn't for them so we owe so much gratitude for, to them and even just the ones who interacted with you know with our tweet today and to give their opinions and to share their insights too it's something that also i feel like makes this show pretty special as we try to involve them as much as possible because like i said we're not here without them we don't do this without them and 100% the biggest disappointment is Jaron Duran, but also I'm going to give him like least valuable player. I'm going to let Sale off the hook and Franchi off the hook because I think I think Franchi's a very good guy. So I'm going to let them off the hook and I've got beef with Jaron Duran. So that is the <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree, but uh as we said in the you know 500th episode to another 600 uh pretty incredible milestone but uh this was a really fun episode i don't know what you think lauren but uh 
definitely get ready for our next episode. It's, it's an interview with uh, Red Sox prospect as well as the Sea Dogs Offensive Player of the Year, Christian Koss. And uh, as we got you guys involved in this episode, we want to do the same for that interview as well. So uh, if you have any questions or any topics you want us to talk to him about, uh, tweet us over at on Twitter. It's LO underscore Red Sox. And also follow us over there as well. You can also follow myself on Twitter. It's at Jake Iggy and also Lauren. La la la. Three laws. Lauren with four R's. But we greatly appreciate everybody tuning into this very fun episode. And uh, we'll continue to bring the fun throughout the off season. I'm just going to use that word as much as I can. But what we always end it. Let's go socks. Peace. <laughs>